Welcome to Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated. Our mission is to take the Word of God to all the world. Our Bible teacher is the director of Bible Tracts, Pastor Mark Smith. Since 1938, Bible Tracts Incorporated has been publishing clear gospel tracts and supplying them to churches, missionaries, and individuals all over the world, and all at no charge. Information on how you can receive a free sample pack of our tracts will be given at the end of this broadcast. Now for our Bible study, here is our teacher, Pastor Mark Smith. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the broadcast. Thanks so much for making our program a part of your day, and thank you for wanting to be a believer that wants to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, right now in front of me, my Bible sits open to the book of 1 John chapter 1. If you can at all, right now, reach over, pick up your own copy of the Word of God and join me there. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 will be our focus today. Along with getting your Bible, get something on which you can jot some notes, because not only do I want you to take notes from our Bible study, but I want you to have pen and paper ready so that when the end of the program comes, my announcer is going to come back on. He's going to give you three ways by which you can give to us your name and mailing address. Do that, and we'll send you that free sample packet. That packet contains about 40 tracks in it. Each one tells the gospel message. It just comes at the gospel message from a different vantage point. I'm going to talk about one in particular here. The one in my hand right now is entitled Riding the Religious Merry-Go-Round. Riding the Religious Merry-Go-Round. This track was written to give to people that go to church all the time. Very religious people, but they do not know Christ as Savior. And by the way, if you are listening to this program on its intended schedule and you're listening in Inside the United States. This is that day called Halloween, and many of us will have little kiddos coming marching to our door, and they will say those famous words, trick or treat. Now, very bluntly, I'm not real big on Halloween, but I do know this. I am big on giving the gospel to somebody who comes to my door looking for me to give them something. Will I give out candy to the munchkins that come to my door? Yes, I will, but I'm going to give them more than that. If you allow me to borrow a Bible verse and give it a little bit of a twist, what shall it profit a child if I give them only candy and I don't give them the gospel? So, if you don't have any tracks, contact your local church. Hopefully, they've got some gospel tracks there and some that are geared for kiddos. Get them and give them out with the candy. When God brings lost people to our door, let's take advantage of it for the glory of God. Amen? Well, before I talk about the gospel track, let me lead into our Bible study this way. Not long ago, again, a complaint was heard in my ears. The complaint was this. Brother Mark, if you keep telling people that our entire Christian life is dependent on God's grace and not on our faithfulness, then people who are saved will end up living any old way they want to. They'll not see the need to live a holy life, end quote. A couple of weeks ago, you may have heard me say that three of my four grandparents were Methodist. They were the Bible-believing kind of Methodist. My other grandmother, she was a Pentecostal, but she too loved the Lord. She was genuinely born again. Now, all four grandparents held to the view that a true believer can lose their eternal life if they commit any sin. My grandparents love Christ, but they would make the kind of statement that I read a moment ago. Do those of us who believe in the eternal security of a believer, do we need to be afraid that born-again people will begin practicing a life pattern of sinfulness? Well, let's talk about that as we come here to 1 John, and particularly verse 8. I mentioned the gospel tract here a moment ago, this one entitled, Riding the Religious Merry-Go-Round. So many people are involved in religious works. They're actually perhaps teaching a class in their church. They're on the uh, decision-making board of their church. They're very involved. They get involved in all kinds of activities, and they feel good about getting to heaven because of their religiosity. They're a church member. Certainly God will let them into heaven. 
but yet they've never, some of them never heard that they must be born again. And this gospel track, Riding the Religious Merry-Go-Round, tells them that good works or religion or sincerity is not going to cut the mustard when it deals with the sin stain on our soul. They need to be born again. Riding the Religious Merry-Go-Round, just one of the tracks in that sample packet. Be ready, jot down our contact information, and by the way, you can just go to our website, which is BibleTracksInc.org, and you can order the sample packet there online. If your Bible is open to 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 says this, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Stop right there. Do you see those three words at the beginning of verse 8? They are, if we say. Now, these are the signal words we've talked about that tell us that a false statement is about to be made. We see these same words not only at verse 8, but we found one at verse 6, and we're going to see one at verse 10. Verse 8 is the second of the three false statements. John the Apostle evidently has heard these words in his day. We continue to hear them in our day. In every era, somebody has been making this kind of a statement. The second false statement comes really as a natural progression after what we dealt with in verse 7. In verse 7, we saw that a true believer has a consistent life practice of walking in the light, walking in holiness. And as he walks in holiness with God, when he does sin, God cleanses that sin. God cleanses it as an ongoing process of God being their father. Now, why does God do that? Two reasons. Number one, God does it because the shed blood of Calvary has an ongoing cleansing power. It never loses its power. But the second reason is this. God cleanses us so that we can stay in fellowship with him while we're in the process of dealing with confessing our sin. Now, since God is perfectly holy and he cannot let sin into his presence, therefore God designed in his salvation plan to include an ongoing cleansing process, a power. But somebody's going to say at this point, well, (laughs) since God has this ongoing cleansing power at work in my life, that I don't have any sin. That's what verse 8 is really saying. Again, let me read verse 8. It says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. A person who would make such a statement has confused things. I'm going to use two words here today, beginning with the letter C. The first one is confusion. Their confusion over the sin in our life. A person who would make the statement here found in verse 8 has confused God's provision for ongoing fellowship, that is, that God has provided ongoing cleansing. They've confused that with a sense that sin, therefore, must not really be a very big deal. But, beloved, you know sin is a big deal. The sin of our life, your life, my life, cost Jesus his life, any sin in us is a real big deal. The sin is real, it's a big deal, and we must confront it. Yes, the ongoing cleansing power is there, but we must confront our sin. Be careful of the confusion over the sin issue in our life. But what does verse 8 say about the person who makes that kind of a statement? It says that we have deceived ourselves. If any believer says that they are walking in the light and fellowshipping with a perfectly holy God, yet sees no sinfulness in himself, they are self-deceived. How did such a person get deceived? The answer is here in verse 8. That gives me my second word beginning with the letter C. It's the word connection. The idea that their life is not connected to truth. Verse 8 says this, the truth is is not in us. The truth is not in us. Any person who is involved with truth, that is truth found in the word of God, that person will see unholiness in themselves as they learn the truth from the word of God and learn about the God who is perfect and holy. Now, let me be very, very careful and very, very clear The person who is making the statement we see in verse 8 is a believer. That is clear. 
the person has, they have believed truth. That's how they got saved. They believe the truth of the gospel. All right, that's a fact. That's clear. What is missing or what is not true in this believer's life is that the truth has not become interwoven into the fabric of their thinking as it ought to be. I'm sure you remember the verse out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I I hope you've memorized that verse. Well, this development of a new life is called progressive sanctification. It takes place this way. First of all, a believer is living his day-to-day life in the light of the truth that he or she knows from the Word of God. They are rejoicing, yes, at the work of salvation which God did for them, but this believer is also reading God's Word. They are attending a Bible-preaching church. He's hanging around other believers and so on, and as he does these things, as he reads and hears, he begins to identify within himself, within herself, that Christ-likeness is not yet fully developed. There are some areas that are not changed. They are not Christ-like. The other word for that is they're, they're still involved and danded by sin. So what does he do? He goes to God asking for help to see this issue changed. What's happening? It's truth. Truth is becoming interwoven into his life. As it interweaves, as truth interweaves, it spots some unholy places in us. When that happens, the Holy Spirit makes us conscious of our need to seek God's forgiveness and help. That is what growing in holiness is all about. That's why verse 9 naturally follows verse 8 here. Believers walking in fellowship with God are having this interweaving process going on in them. And when truth spots unholiness, all of a sudden we see the sin in us. We see things that are contrary to God. We run to God for help. We run to God for forgiveness. And we grow progressively, step by step, in holiness, Christ-likeness, separated unto God. What a great truth. Everybody, when you think of 1 John chapter 1, and when I began to talk about how this is a basic passage for believers, immediately people began to run and jump to verse 9. Verse 9 is a great verse, but this whole passage, verses 5 through 10, is about what is the basis of our fellowship with God. Are the basis of our fellowship with God is holiness. How do we stay holy? We let the truth of God spot unholiness, we confess it, and we go grow on to more Christ-likeness. Now, the takeaway from this lesson in Bible study today is this. Has God been calling you to confess a sinful area or a sin issue, a non-Christ-like issue in your life? Has he been doing that in recent days? If he has, deal with it and let your fellowship with God deepen Let your experience of the life of God deepen. Become more like Christ. That's why the Spirit of God has brought conviction. And that's why the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Thank you for joining us today for Bible Tract Echoes. If you would like to receive a free sample packet of our tracts, you can contact us by calling 309 828 6888. Our mailing address is Bible Tracks, P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois 61702. Again, our phone number is 309 828 6888. And our mailing address is P.O. Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois 61702. You can also contact us through our website. Our web address is BibleTracksInc.org. Remember, the word tracks is spelled T-R-A-C-T-S. That address is BibleTracksInc.org. May the Lord richly bless you as you serve Him.